In this episode, I am speaking with the legendary Fritz Coleman, who went from being the weathercaster for NBC in Los Angeles from 1982 to 2020 to co-hosting the Media Path podcast with the Luis Palenker in 2020. Fritz has an inspiring story to tell that you need to hear. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies, listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers, and finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 320 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller, and I'll be your host every Monday for a discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. In this episode, I am speaking with the legendary Fritz Coleman, who went from being the weathercaster for NBC in Los Angeles from 1982 to 2020 to co-hosting the Media Path podcast with the Luis Palenker in 2020. Fritz has an inspiring story to tell that you need to hear. Let me read from his Wikipedia page. Yes, he has a Wikipedia page. After growing up in Radnor, Pennsylvania, he attended Salem University in West Virginia and Temple University in Philadelphia, where he studied radio, television, and film. Like many popular weather anchors, he serves as a reporter instead of a meteorologist, since he doesn't have a degree in meteorology. He worked as a comedian and disc jockey for several years and as a radio personality J. Fredericks at WBEN and later WKBW in Buffalo, New York. He left Buffalo for Los Angeles in 1980 to work as a stand-up comic. In 1982, he began work as the weekend weatherman at KNBC and became the weekday weatherman in 1984. He also hosted or appeared on a number of other KNBC shows, such as It's Fritz from 1988 to 1990 and What a Week from 1990 to 1991. He has written and performed two one-man theater acts titled The Reception and It's Me, Dad. He received the 2004 EMA Community Service Award for his involvement with KNBC's For Our Planet, a children's program. He appeared in the supporting role in one of Raymond Burr's last Perry Mason television films, The Case of the Telltale Talk Show Host, in 1983. He received a thanks credit on the film Wake Up, Ron Burgundy, The Lost Movie, an alternative film companion to Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy. From 2009 to 2011, Coleman did the weekday weather in addition to KNBC for San Diego's NBC affiliate KNSD. On June 17, 2020, Coleman announced he would retire on Friday, June 26, after almost 40 years at KNBC. I think you'll find Fritz's story quite entertaining, but more importantly, inspiring. This episode is sponsored by the Career Pivot community, but more on that later. Without delay, let's get to my discussion with Fritz Coleman. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I have the real joy of having the legendary Fritz <laughs> Coleman. And let me read you real quickly. Fritz Coleman is a legendary Los Angeles weatherman and humorist. Luis Palenker is the filmmaker and columnist and co-founder of Premier Radio, and they are the hosts of Media Path Podcast. And I wanted to have Fritz on and talk about his podcast. So, Fritz, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy to be here. And, you know, I'm, just so your audience knows contractually, you have to say legendary every time you mention my name. So, <laughs> please do. 
Well, I really enjoy your podcast. And I got to tell you, the title of your podcast is very engaging for those of us of a certain age. What did you do in the first half of life? First half of life, I was uh, trying to uh, extract my head from other parts of my body and figure out what I was doing. But I, I was just on a on a quest to figure out where I plugged in. Uh, I, I sort of stumbled across every um, sort of plateau that I reached in my life. I uh, was in the Navy for four years. When I was in the Navy, I worked for Armed Forces Radio and Television, which introduced me to my career. Then when I got out of the Navy, I was in the radio business for 15 years. I was a DJ and a talk show host and a production director and so forth. While I was doing radio, I was uh, uh, dabbling in the stand-up comedy business because when you are in when you were in radio in the 70s, you would get invited to host at various clubs. So I used to write material for myself to uh, to just sort of survive in the club hosting environment. And then I became smitten by stand-up comedy. In 1980, I came out to Los Angeles to pursue a career in stand-up. I was working at the comedy store. And this is absolutely a true story. Real meteorologists hate this story, but I'm going to tell you anyway. So I'm on stage at the comedy store. I'm talking about being forced to do the weather for armed forces, radio and television, but not knowing anything about it. But the Navy didn't seem to care that I didn't know anything about weather. Just get up there and fill the two and a half minutes without using profanity. That was their idea. So I told this little anecdote about that on stage. And after my show was over at the comedy store, the news director from NBC in Los Angeles and his wife were in the audience. And he came up and introduced himself and said, this is a very odd question. Do you have any desire to come to Channel 4 and do some vacation relief weather forecasting? I need some help. I have a guy who hasn't had a vacation in a while. I, I thought I explained on stage that I don't know anything about weather. He said, this is perfect. There's no weather in California. This will work out great. So I auditioned to get the weekend weather job. I got the weekend weather job. A couple of years later, I was bumped up to the main weather job. And I retired a couple of years ago, two weeks shy of my 40th anniversary at NBC. And so I built towards legendary status in the latter third of my life. <laughs> well, it reminds me of the, I went to Hawaii um, after I, after my bike accident, I, I haven't, I rewarded myself with a bike tour around the big Island. Oh, nice. And I kept on watching the TV news saying, well, what's the weather? <laughs> and all they, all they would do is report on the, on the, um, uh, ocean levels and the yeah, current surf and stuff. Of course. Yeah. The surf, it's surf 76 condition. and sunny with afternoon showers, like 30%. That's right. Hawaii. But I, I've had, I, I've been the beneficiary of insane amounts of good luck in my life. And I had this wonderful career. I was able to continue my stand up comedy career as I was doing the weather. Cause I was in LA and I would work do two or three shows a week while I was doing the weather. But I also had two kids and this weather job gave me the gift of stable employment. So I didn't have to go on the road and do bad gigs around the United States for $600 a week. And after I paid for my own transportation, coming home with $50 in my pocket, I couldn't do it. So I, I again, I, I benefited from some great strokes of luck. So you retired. Was that your choice or their choice? No, it was totally my choice. Uh, I was getting ready to renew my contract. Uh, I was getting to a certain age. I'm almost 75. And uh, so I was over 70. Uh, the only thing that I ever resented about my, not resented is the wrong word, regretted about my job as a weatherman is I had to do the 11 o'clock news. And that took me out of the lives of my two older children to where I couldn't put them to bed at night. I couldn't help with their homework. And I always felt guilt about that. So I thought I'm getting to a certain age. Now I have two grandchildren. I don't want to repeat that behavior with my grandchildren. So I thought it's time to retire. It's time to step aside. Plus, you had the added benefit of climate change. And suddenly a comedian doing the weather was no longer relevant because the world's falling apart. So I thought this is a good time to step aside. So you retire. And what was your next step? Well, after I which gets to the to the podcast. My friend, my co-host, Louise Palanker, and I have been friends for 30, 35 years. She actually produced two of my one-person shows earlier in my career, and we've always been friends. And we've always had 
sort of simpatico about politics and books and movies and TV shows and kind of a similar sense about all the, you know, the popular zeitgeist of what was going on. But I couldn't do a podcast. I couldn't enter into any other media enterprise while I was under contract to NBC. So when I retired, I was free to do whatever I want. She said, why don't we come and do a podcast together and we'll just make the podcast a continuation of the great conversations we have every day, which involve media. So we start the Media Path podcast with maybe some suggestions about what you can listen to or read or watch on streaming. And then we have guests on of any walk of life. We have politicians, we have uh, filmmakers, we have authors, and just uh, have a great time learning things about things we don't know anything about. And we're having a blast doing it. Is there plans to make money from this? Is this just a passion project? I would say it's a passion project right now. The The hardest part of the learning curve for me was to not be obsessed by ratings and listeners and viewers. When you're in the television business or in the radio business, but mainly the television business, you are obsessed with the daily machinations of the ratings. You have overnight ratings and you get up in the morning, you parse them. Oh, my God, the ratings during the weather went down a tenth of a point. It's terrible. And then you also have rating sweeps four times a year, which is how advertising dollars are set. And you obsess over these things. What you have to do in a podcast, and I'm not telling you something, you, you've been on the air longer than we have, is there are so many podcasts in existence. There are, I, I think the number is like 150, 160,000 podcasts existing in the United States. You can't obsess over how few people are listening to your podcast. You just have to do the best you can and hope you can build on your strengths and over a period of time, uh, get a lot of viewers. We're not doing it for my, we're not monetized in any way. We don't have enough listeners yet. We're up to about 135 episodes, but we're not monetized in any way. We'd love to be, but it's not our obsession. We're just doing it because we love doing it and we're friends and it's, it's a great uh, mental exercise for me every week. Well, I can tell you for me that I would do this podcast for no other reason than the cool people I meet. Absolutely. Well, that that's that exactly explains why I like to do it. You mean, hell, I have Fritz Coleman on my podcast. You're very lucky. You have no idea how fortunate. <laughs> and this is my first international broadcast. I want you to know that as well. So I feel very lucky as well. <laughs> You're up to about 135 episodes. Mm -hmm. What kind of guests have you had on? And who has been your favorite guest? I, I think Wheezy, as I call my co-host, her name is Louise. And she got the name Wheezy because she used to be an intern. I, she was a page on the old Jefferson's TV show. And of course, there was Wheezy on there. So they named her Wheezy. Uh, we would probably answer you the same way. And that would be Henry Winkler. Henry, Henry's been on twice, maybe the single loveliest human being in show business. Uh, very, very approachable. Uh, uh, the, the best guess for me, and maybe you'll agree with this, is a really talented person who's comfortable in their own skin. They don't condescend when they talk to you. They don't try to prove they know more than you do. They're just very relatable. And Henry is the definition of that. It, it, we... Uh, Weezy and I and Henry co-produced a pilot for Comedy Central called The Couch, which was um, three comedians on a couch. People would bring in, a couple would bring in uh, uh, problems in their relationship. And the comedians, in their infinite wisdom, would try to help them solve these problems. And so uh, Comedy Central bought it. So we got to go around town and do these pitches with the great Henry Winkler, the Fonz. And the fun was to walk around and watch people react to this man. You'd go into like ICM or some other place where there's a meeting and the seas would part and it was the Fonz and everybody would come up and he would be patient and make eye contact with and sign an autograph with everybody. And he's just the loveliest man. So to answer your question, I would say Henry, but we've had people who are the pinnacle of all their various careers. Like we just had Adam Schiff on who was, uh, who's running for Senate in the, uh, in the state of California. We've had great, uh, rock stars from the sixties and seventies. When I was in radio, we had Felix Cavalieri, the great keyboardist from the young rascals, who was fantastic. We had John Sebastian. We had, uh, 
Gary Puckett of the Union Gap. I mean, we've had great baby boomer uh, guests because that's our our era. We've had documentary filmmakers. My favorite kind of a guest is a guest where you have a preconceived notion of what they're going to be like, and then they completely flip you on your head. And the a, a great example of that is Christopher Knight, who was on The Brady Bunch. And, you know, actors have the uh, the rep of being very, you know, about as deep as a coat of paint. And they, they're they not, uh, you know, they're not particularly deep and they can't speak off script. Christopher Knight was mind-blowing. He was so brilliant. First of all, he's a computer genius. When he retired from acting, he started a computer company and sold that and became infinitely wealthy and now just does all kinds of computer-oriented things. So the great fun, and maybe you'll agree with this, is to meet somebody and learn some huge uh, revelation about them as a human being that you didn't know, and it's fun for everybody. And so I, lo I love that aspect of it. So I have favorite guests in, a many, in many different genres. This episode is sponsored by the Career Pivot Membership Community. The Career Pivot Membership Community is a group of people from all over the U.S. and Canada with diverse backgrounds. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else out, figure out what they want to do in the second half of life, and then make it happen. Many have made changes that they did not know existed or was possible when they came to the community. They learn from each other and broaden their horizons on what was really possible. Let's hear what Debbie said about being part of the community. I think the main things I'm getting out of the community are accountability and support. Just getting on every week and talking with people from the What's Next group and seeing the same people every week, watching everyone else's progress kind of motivates me to do more and also feeling like, yeah, there are other people out there that are that are watching <laughs> and just motivates me to keep moving on my journey. And I also paired up with an accountability partner and we have calls every other week. And so we've been um, looking over each other's resumes and just talking about, you know, what we plan to do, what we're enjoying, what we're not enjoying. So I think just having somebody there to bounce ideas around with is, is really helpful. And also, I think as I've gone through this journey with the people in the What's Next group, we're getting to know each other. I feel like I'm getting great feedback from everybody because they can see things that I can't see. It's also nice to have people who are cheering you on and they're going to uh, cheer you on through your successes and they're going to help you through your failures and you're going to learn from other people's experiences. You can't just join the community. I bring people into the community every few months in groups. You can sign up for the waiting list so when I open the door for new members, you'll be notified. If you're interested in learning more about the endeavor and sign up for the waiting list, please go to careerpivot.com slash community. Now, back to the episode. So how difficult is it for you to book some of these well-known people? Well, it's getting less difficult. Mark, and as you know, you know what happens is that you – over a period of time, we've been on the air for like two and a half years, you you gain the trust of publicists. So they put some of their B or C level talent on there and their B and C level talent reports back to them. They've had a spectacular time. These two people, Fritz and Wheezy, did their homework. They read the book. They asked not the typical red carpet step and repeat questions. And we had a wonderful time. So, okay, then we'll trust them with slightly higher caliber talent. And we're in L.A., so there's never a problem booking people. So we're, we're getting to the point now where people trust us with their high-end clients, and, and uh, it's a lot of fun. And so, you know, it's it's uh, it's a building process. Well, it's, it's interesting. I started this podcast in October of 2016 to support my second edition of my book, the summer of 2018, we spent five months in Mexico. We thought we were going to go down to Mexico for three months. 
it ended up being five months and we were just having our mail collected by our neighbors and just had our neighbors throw them a box. Well, we came back in October and I had in that box was five, six, seven books from major publishers. They just mailed me. I went, what? Uh, <laughs> and from that point on, I mean, I'm pitched all the time. That's not, but well, see, that's great. Plus, you're also an author, so they knew that you would sort of get the mechanics of that business. Yeah, well. and um, and one of the things I had to learn is I'm a great interviewee. Mm -hmm. I am not a great interviewer. I am a good conversationalist. Oh, that's I, I think I really got you put your finger on. I think that's what makes a good podcast is the intimacy of a regular conversation. It's not a broadcast. It's a conversation. You're inviting people to listen in on this conversation. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting as I've listened to some of your episodes, you and Wheezy play off mm -hmm. each other very well. Mm -hmm. you obviously you've known each other for quite a while. Right. So how much planning do you put into each one of your episodes? Well, we have a booker. Uh, I do the least amount of work of anybody on the show. I read the book or see the movie or formulate my questions ahead of time. But Wheezy is a documentary filmmaker. Yeah. She's done a couple of documentaries that have done the festival. She created a great doc that's actually still on Amazon Prime called The Cow Sills, a family band, which is about the cow sills, the family band that the, the Partridge family was fashioned after. So she's an editor and all that stuff. We do the show and then she does the hard work for two days, which is to post produce this show, add visual components, and we post it on YouTube. So she does a lot of work. We have Dina Friedman, who is our booker, who finds the guests for us. And then we have uh, Wheezy at her home has a beautiful four station podcasting arrangement. And we have an engineer there. And so there are people that are working harder than I am. So my mission is just to uh, prepare myself for the interview, which is not hard. You know, you have... You have a block of questions, but then you sort of go down a rabbit hole when when the guest introduces something you weren't planning on. And, you know, that's the fun of it. Yeah, I have I have a formula. I always start out if it's an author, I say, why did you write the book? And then I have sp specific topics I want to from the book I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. But with someone like you and I know I because I've listened to your a bunch of episodes, of your podcast, mm -hmm. I want to get into what you're getting out of it, the process that how, how did you get into this? Because we have similar uh, audiences mm -hmm. and the folks over 55 is the smallest demographic listening to podcasts. Yes. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's a very, it's a very slow growth. You're probably a year yes. away from monetization. Absolutely. But, um, and I listened to some of your early shows and some of your audio in the beginning really sucked. Which well, that's because we were doing it all from Zoom, yes. which was awful. And yeah. I apologize for that because they're hard to listen to. But you learn over time. Yeah. So where do you see this going? Where do you want to take it? I haven't put the pressure on myself to say, okay, we want to be at point B. We're at point A now. But I, do, I, I want to do this as long as I enjoy it. Uh, what I'm finding out is that I have never been happier in my life than I am right now. I am retired, but I'm filling my life with a lot of very fulfilling things. I get to do the podcast. Stand-up comedy is opening back up. Speaking of a, of a, of a, a particular demographic, I just uh, dropped a show on Tubi streaming service called Unassisted Living, which is about, an, it's an hour of doing stand-up about getting old and growing old during the pandemic and being a grandparent during the pandemic. So be sure to watch it. It's free. It's on Tubi. So I'm doing my, and I'm on the board of directors of three nonprofits in Southern California. So I, my life is full of things that massage my heart. I'm having, honestly, I've never been happier in my life or more fulfilled. Time just I mean, I can't believe how busy I am. I can't believe it. I mean, other people who had retired early said, you'd be surprised. The time just goes crazy. And they're a thousand percent right because I'm doing things I love to do. And I'm more present for my family now than I was when I was working. Yeah. If, I've got a great book for you called The Happiness Curve by Jonathan Rausch. I've had Jonathan on the podcast. Wow. That sounds like a great book. And it talks about, he, he well, he's a, 
very famous author. And mm-hmm. he talks about the fact that, you know, we're at least happy in our late thirties and early forties and we hit the trough. And at that point, happiness just goes up. Yes. And you take all the pressures of existence off yourself and just go for it. Well, more importantly, I know it's, that's that curve works for me. I'll tell you that. Well, more importantly, you're doing something that you really enjoy. It's it's obvious to me listening to you and Wheezy that you're having a good time with this. You're you're talking about the news and what's going on in media. We have a good time, and you're having a good time. Mm -hmm. And and I encourage everyone to you know check it out. Um, So, how hard was it to get started? Well, I, I had the benefit of having a, a partner, uh, yep. Louise. This is her fifth podcast. Okay. As she will tell you, she started. She she began her podcasting career when podcasting started okay. years ago, and she had one for teenagers, which was really wonderful, actually. Uh, where she had a panel of five kids, and they would answer questions from other kids around the world who would phone in their sort of their adolescent questions. And it was really wonderful. Then she did one called uh, about uh, family history. It was diaries, uh, because her father uh, had a very interesting backstory. Her father, she, she's Jewish, and her father was a soldier during the Second World War. And her father was in a platoon of soldiers that was actually responsible for liberating one of the concentration camps in Poland. So you can imagine being a Jewish young soldier in the early 20s and doing that. So he has a great backstory. So she got involved in that. But anyway, she she did a couple of podcasts and knew the mechanics of it, had the whole studio tricked out, had the machine oiled, had producers and, and engineers. And I just had to step in and get on the wave and ride. If there was one thing that you get out that out of being doing this podcast that you would say to someone Who's saying, ah, I can't do a podcast. That, what's the one thing that you absolutely get out of this that you say, you got to do this because. Okay. Well, I think you answered that question in an earlier comment you made, which is maybe we weren't on the air at that time, but you're not a broadcaster. You said, but you are a great conversationalist. That's all it requires. Everybody has a story. Everybody's interested in other people's opinions about stuff. You don't have to be a famous person to have an engaging opinion or a, an engaging viewpoint. And everybody's got an interesting backstory. So you need to put out of your mind that you're not prepared to do it. If you can have a a, a lucid conversation with another adult, you can do a podcast. And the fact that you're not a professional and that it's intimate and not polished and just sort of... Uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, uh, I think one of the great interviewers of all time was Charlie Rose. And what I loved about him was he was in this black box arrangement. All you could see were the guests' faces and heads, and they were around a table, but it really forced the intimacy of the conversation. And I, I, I that's what I always loved about it. It was just the conversation between two smart people. So I, it's not as hard to start a podcast as you might think, and you should at least try it. First of all, with the internet, and the technology to start a podcast is not expensive at all. So, Fritz, this has been great. I really enjoyed our conversation. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm admitting to you that I didn't know that much about your career, being an author and a great conversationalist. But really, I was so fascinated by the title of your podcast, I couldn't wait to do it. Well, if someone wanted to reach out and contact you and listen to your podcast, where might they find you? Okay, we have a brand new website we're very proud of. It's mediapathpodcast.com. We also have a fan page there. We have a uh, a, a listener group. We have a newsletter that Weezy does, a very amusing newsletter. Just go on to Media Path Podcast. It'll tell you everything. We have all of our past episodes there. We have a little biographical information about us. She's actually a great American success story. She started a radio company called Premier Radio Networks, which eventually became so huge, they sold to Clear Channel, which became so huge, they sold to iHeartRadio. So she she's had an amazing career, and uh, you'll, you'll learn interesting things. So go to mediapathpodcast.com. And we'll include links to all of that in the show notes. So Fritz, thank you very much for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. 
It was an honor. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation, Mark. Appreciate it. Hope you found that valuable. I had a lot of fun speaking with the legendary Fritz Coleman. I mean, how often do I get to speak with someone who I have to say legendary when I mention their name? Take a moment, go to careerpivot.com and sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You will get a weekly update on this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. When you subscribe, you will receive my latest white paper, Ageism, the Last Acceptable Bias. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode dash 320. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. In fact, this podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. Hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career podcast.